I think it's probably time for me to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Um, we like to acclaim, don't we, this city as a very inventive place with lots of inventive people in its story. Um, many of them are famous, very well known. I mean, to talk about Frank Whittle, uh, James Starley, J.K. Starley. Um, these are famous inventors. Um, but there are plenty of others, not so well known, that Coventry has, uh, has, has brought <coughs> into being. Um, and tonight, we're going to hear about another uh, tremendously inventive, if less well-known, figure. Um, next to me here is Adrian Padfield. Um, Adrian's a, a retired consultant anaesthetist um, who has long had a fascination with Alvis cars. He bought his first, you know, bought his 1927 Alvis sports car on qualifying as a doctor in 1961. And that's relevant because tonight he's going to talk about his new book uh, down there. Uh, so if anybody wants to buy one, they'll be um, offered at a very competitive rate later on. Um, but Edwin's going to talk about George Smith Clark, who was, I think, chief engineer <coughs> at Alvis, but many other things too. Edwin. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry that my computer did sort of fit in with your stuff. Um, genius may be too much of a term, but he certainly, in, in the auto car, he was described as an engineering genius. Um, and it's, as, as uh, Peter said, it's derived from my book, Country, Alvis and the Iron Lung. And having an old Alvis and being an anaesthetist, you'll see that these two things come together in me. And I should have written this book 30 years ago, when there were one or two people who knew him still. But work interfered. <laughs> um, I'd like you to be fairly informal. If you don't understand something or you don't hear it properly, do interrupt me and, and ask. I really, um, yeah. Anyway, um, that's... Now, we start off with this birth certificate. I don't know whether it's completely legible, but he was born in Beaudley, and you'll see... Well, I've got a pointer. <laughs> I'd just like to point out that his... Those are his Christian names, George Thomas. And it, the reason was that his mother's maiden name was Smith and her father was George Thomas Smith and so obviously she had him named after her father. Um, he was a brass founder in Beaudley and in the 1881 census he was the proprietor of George D. Smith and Sons brass founders employing six men and five boys. Um, Henry Clark, George's father, is described as a brass finisher, and I think he worked for the uh, Harriet's father. But um, he died in February 1897 when George was age 12, and he had to then help support the family. Um, in the 1901 census return, it shows Harriet Clark as a, um, <coughs> a widow and a life insurance agent. <coughs> And he lived in his house, and you do see there's an elderly Alvis, not mine, um, and the, the, this was the house. It's six lower park in Beatley. In the 1901 census, his mother was uh, said to be a, a widow in a life assurance agency, which you know, obviously meant collecting premiums. And George is 16 at the same address, and his occupation is chemist messenger. Now, I think that meant he took prescription from, but I, kind of, I don't seem to be anywhere finding out exactly. Yeah. He had four sisters and one brother, all younger than him, except a, an adopted sister, uh, uh, older than him, who was 25. <laughs> Later, he said as a youth he was interested in electrics, but he was also interested in motorised transport. When he was interviewed by the motor in, in 1933 about independent front suspension, he tells how he made a three-wheeler runabout that had independent front suspension constructed out of scrap from a wheelwright's shop. 
<laughs> uh, 28 late, years later, he used the, the same system with the front wheel drive Alvis of the late 1920s. Anyway, that's jumping ahead of that. In 1901 or two, and I think it might have been, you know, his birth date was the 23rd of December, and I suspect that he joined at the end of uh, that year, so he made it just 1901. He joined the Great Western Railway Engineering Department in Swindon. Um, I don't know why he went to Swindon. There was a, quite a well-known engineer from Birmingham who settled in, in uh, Bewdley and did various things. Uh, um, maybe he got interested. Um, soon after that, he made a, a, a motorcycle out of water piping that weighed four and a half hundred weight and used a Clement Garrard's engine. But having shown an aptitude for mechanical and electrical engineering, he was transferred to the road motor department in Slough in 1905. There he went, did everything, you know, went, went through all the departments and so on and so forth, involved in um, servicing and repair. But he got a reputation for the adjustment and repair of magnetos, which was a a mystery to his colleagues, and he said that he later said it was his first chance of advancement in the GWR. And I, I don't want to bring it up now, but there's, there's something quite interesting about that. There's a lot of about his work on early road vehicles in his chairman's request to the Automobile Division of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers in January 1948. Quote As a youth, I had been very interested in electrics and made myself. Electrostatic machines, Windsor's machines, do they remember Windsor's machines? Yes, <laughs> I think pretty clever to make one. Um, and, um, and spark cars, mostly in connections with experiments in x rays and wireless transmission, prompted by the earlier work of Rotchen and Mark Henning. Now, Rotchen discovered x rays on the 8th of November 1895. <laughs> and in the late 1890s, Marconi first achieved wireless transmission. So his, in, his interest in electrics started in his <coughs> early teens. But later on, in <coughs> 1912, he attended evening class at the Regent Street Polytechnic, now the University of West Pitcher, for the City and Guild's Automobile Engineering course. Um, this is uh, uh, from... Uh, March, uh, yes, March 1911, Great Western Railway um, magazine. I, I think you read it quite well. It's pretty good, and it, it's interesting actually um, so how they spell employee. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't want the E, and there's no hyphen. <laughs> Nobody knows exactly when they start, how they started. But I, I actually went to the, the British newspaper, library newspaper branch in London and looked at the editions of the commercial motor. Um, and towards the back of each weekly issue of contributions from drivers and mechanics, and a prize of 10 shillings was awarded for the best entry. Now, I don't know, but I think that would probably worth about 50 quid a day. Any, any offers? You know, it, it, 10 bob was pretty good work. Um, and but then he won the prize seven times, <laughs> and on the fifteenth of December he was awarded the bonus award of two guineas. I think that's probably worth at least one hundred and fifty, maybe two hundred pounds. But it's supposed to be quite nice for Christmas and his birthday. And um, on the 29th of April, however, he was involved in an accident at work and severely damaged, uh, injured. Um, it said to be a bowling explosion driving his glasses into his mouth, which I find hard to believe. But, you know, I, I only have hearsay. He can, I, can, I can't find anything more about it. But for years he suffered from severe headaches. He thought he was going mad at one point. Because if they, so he couldn't take his exam, uh, the sitting Gill's exam, um, and I've had read comments about him from modern engineers. Well, he had no qualifications. Well, you know, that's, uh, qualifications weren't quite so important in those days. I was told he grew his nostalgia because of this accident, but he was clean shaven by the 1930s. In 1911, 
he was a boarder living in Slough, and his mother still lived in, in um, Bewley and was now a certified midwife. He became a draftsman in the drawing office at Slough, and in 1913 was promoted to chief draftsman. So he was, a, you know, obviously well thought of. He tried to join the armed forces, but was turned down on health guard. And in 1915, two very important things happened. He was recruited to the Royal Aircraft Factory in Farnborough. Now, when I was doing this, it said RAF, and I thought immediately, Royal Air Force. No, it can't have been. It wasn't start until the 1st of April of 1918. Then I eventually realised it meant aircraft factory. And he was posted to the Aeronautical Inspection Directory in Coventry as an inspector of aero engines. Though that was the first time he came to Coventry in 1915. And, but also, when he was in Coventry, he got married in um, uh, at Oldbourne. Now, this is the wedding certificate. That, I'm pretty sure, has been changed from 25 to 26. Now you say, can you get married on Christmas Day? You can. You can. The figure's a bit busy, um, but you know, it's quite possible. Well, yes, but also, his birthday was on the 23rd of December, 1884. So he's actually only 31. Was he being gallant? But even more, In fact, um, Mary Walker, his wife, spinster, was actually rather older than 38. Oh. I'll tell you about it in a minute. <laughs> now, what I cannot find out is how they came to meet. Allborn is actually about six miles uh, southeast of Swindon, um, and she had a drapery and a grocery shop in Allborn. And it's possible she supplied fabrics or food to the Great Western Hospital in Swindon, which was run in a sort of almost prototype of the NHS. They treated all their staff free. Um, no records, certainly. I, I can find out nothing about it. Um, but if, if, if he got to know her much earlier, then he would have been able to travel back to Swindon, perhaps all born. Um, because you get free rail uh, travel. Actually, the clue to this is this lady here. Now, Mary Walker was working with Eleanor dressmaking in Link, and she'd actually been born in Staffordshire in January 1869, so she was actually nearly 46. And um, these things happen. Um, the, just a little aside, he lived in Witterington Road in Coventry, and, and at right angles, so it was Allborn Road, yeah. I think. Yes, <laughs> my dad was born in Allborn Road well, in yeah. 1918. Yeah. 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 Anyway, <laughs> um, in the... Um, <clears throat> this is from the Great Western magazine, and it, I, I need you to read it a little bit, because it's... It, it, Goes over something that I said already. Um, all the RAF engines promoted. Da, 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 da. He was advanced to a uh, commission as first lieutenant, but he, he he was responsible for materials inspection and testing of some 12,500 air engines of all types, and he installed chemical and metallurgical laboratories. <coughs> installed his own work. Da, 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 da. And, what is interesting again is the magneto business, but also he was quite um, uh, did a lot of work for. Um, I'm going to go back one now. That's actually him in his, and I only came across that quite late in his first lieutenant's uniform. It's obviously a post picture, but but it is um, Royal Flying Corps, and later ones he's on in RAF uniform. Okay. Um, the, uh, 
Sorry, just to, just to go back. <coughs> yeah. The, the, what I would say is that he was responsible eventually. He became a captain, an honorary captain, um, and he was responsible for all the air engines inspection in Coventry and Birmingham, which were Austin and Lang uh, Lanchester and so on, and Derby, which was Rolls Royce, and Dumfries, which was Arrow Johnson. Um, but his main field of interest, as it said there, is his standardization of jigs and gauges to ensure the interchangeability of parts, principally for car magneto and carburetor jets. Now, the carburetor jet standard that he, he um, um, produced remained a British standard institution uh, um, standard until after World War II. <coughs> after the Great War, he became assistant works manager at Daimler, which was, I think, a scheme for an employment of ex servicemen. And I think at this time, his, his abilities and his energy were being stretched, and they took up several <coughs> hobbies. He was interested in astronomy, and I think this was a telescope he made himself. I, I don't know, and I can no way of finding out, but he, um, this is in the garden of his first house, which I forget for the moment where it is, but it, it was, I think it was in Kenilworth actually. Um, but it, this was in 1920, it was a very, very busy year, obviously using up his uh, sort of energy and enthusiasm. Uh, he helped found a branch of the Royal Astronomical Society in Coventry, and about the same time he made his own telescope, this one. And also, this is a six and a quarter inch Cook, and Cook apparently is a very well known name for telescopes. It's, um, the curious thing is, it went to the Coventry Technical College Astronomical Society in 1940, and then uh, about, oh, I think 10, 20, 10 or 20 years ago, it went to Canada, and I praised it there. <laughs> um, by 1928, he had a 12-inch reflector telescope and was involved with the Coventry Society, and he joined the British Astronomical in 1934. Also in 1920, he had an early amateur radio license, call sign 2PV, and the post office would send out cards saying when they were transmitting <coughs> to 5 p.m. Uh, to 11. Um, and he monitored there and he had a letter from a, a general ferrier uh, of the French um, army because he monitored the transmissions from I the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> He applied for and got a patent for a speaking telephone in London. <coughs> um, and it could have been uh, a good patent to uh, uh, use for loudspeakers, but never was. And then in the light car and cycle car of the 25th of December 1920, there's a description of a speedy, privately built cycle car he had built in three months, capable of 56 miles an hour. Um, and he also made the GSC auto select that was marketed at the, at the Ken, as the kennel one, as well as astronomy and amateur radio. Other work interests were beekeeping, amateur dramatics, rifle shooting, tennis. Apparently, he made a metal tennis racket with wire strings, <laughs> and Freemasonry at the Trinity Lodge. In 1920, T.G. Uh, John started the new Alvis and Engineering Company in Coventry. During the Great War, he, John had been works manager and chief engineer of Sydney Deasy, producing the Puma area of the scene. So it's almost impossible that he didn't uh, meet Smith Clark as, as the inspector of uh, their engine. He bought, John bought Holly Brothers in 1919, and amongst other things, built those scooters. He bought the drawings of a one and a half meter engine de designed by GPH de Fraser, who most likely invented the Alvis, name Alvis for a new aluminum piston, paying royalties for its use, and the Alvis name 
in a triangle. The first car in 1920 was a 1030. In 1922, T.G. John asked Smith Clark to look at the 1030. After careful inspection, Smith Clark is reputed to have said, it's a bad, it's bad car and it's badly built. It might not have been too serious, <laughs> and it was only reported, but um, it, it was actually quite a good car for its um, age. But John promptly invited him to come chief engineer of Elvis. There he designed the 1250 Elvis, which was effectively an overhead valve engine uh, of the 1030, uh, which was very successful. And it was, its success was really kicked off by the fact that they, they won the 200 mile race at Brooklyn at an average speed of 93 miles an hour. Okay, it's just going round and round and round, but it's quite a good going. But there's some pretty heavy uh, foreign um, opposition who usually won. Um, and there's Harvey as the driver and Pat. Tatters all the run in the and there's the man himself. Okay, um, uh, he, a year or two after that, he thought, well, you know, it's all very well driving the back wheels, but it would be better if we drove the front wheels. And he designed <coughs> the first front wheel drive Alvis in 1925. And in 1928, front wheel drive Alvis cars came first and second in the one and a half litre class at Le Mans. Now, I'm not going to go into all his engineering stuff uh, because it goes on and on. <laughs> um, the, the headaches he suffered probably after the accident in 1911 were so severe he thought he was going mad. And he was off sick from January to August 1931. And he consulted ENT and ISO and, and then many therapists. But in 1933, he was appointed a director at Alvis. And in 1935, he became chairman of the Commentary and Warwickshire Hospital. Um, but he'd already been involved to a certain extent with um, medical matters. When the war came, as we all know, Commentary as one of the main engineering centres in Britain with suffered very severe damage. Both the Commentary and Warwickshire Hospital and um, the Alvis main Alvis factory was severely damaged. Um, and here's Smith Clark with George uh, VI and behind the matron with Queen Elizabeth, who became the Queen Mother. Um, and there's another one which I, I, I really love. He's, he's so sort of self-deprecating. They're obviously get, get saying goodbye to him and uh, he sort of shy a bit. <laughs> um, anyway, it, it, amongst other things he did then was to have a, 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 a surgical hospital, a casualty block, built in the grounds of a convalescent home in Kersley. I believe people say Kersley, didn't they? Yeah, Kersley. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it, I'm not showing you a picture, but it was pretty, pretty impressive effort. Um, in, and in 1946, he made drawings for a new commentary hospital, but the other end of the NHS probably put a stop to that. After his wife's death in 1945, he married his, her nurse, Elsie Richards, on the 19th of February 1946. Actually, I, I've had access to a lot of his pocket diaries, and he doesn't mention getting married. <laughs> um, in 1947 to 1950, he was very active in amateur radio, and particularly on the VHF bands. And, uh, oh yes, this is his shack, um, which is, I, I don't know if it's not very obvious, but that's a point of which way the aerials ran. And this is his, at the beginning of the war, all amateur licenses were cancelled, and this is a post-war one. Um, but uh, I don't know whether they know the QSL cards, they're sent out when you speak to somebody over or contact somebody, you post them a card <coughs> to uh, confirm it. But also, he was still interested in, uh, 
เป็นไอ้ดูคะแนนที่หนึ่งนิวเทิร์นนิวเทิร์นเรฟเล็กเตอร์เทเลสโคปอินมาการ์ and that thing on there is a spectroheliscope for examining the sun um, and the r e p h o t o g r a p h in the in the um, in the papers of, of, of Um, eclipse. Um, it, in 1948, at the beginning of the NHS, Smith Clark was appointed vice chairman of the Coventry Nun Eaton and Rugby Group Hospital Management Committee, HMC 20. Then, when he retired from Alvis in 1950, he was made chairman. He had his own workshop. Um, yes, I just that, that's the, the uh, telescope, which is now. Uh, in the hands of the Salford Astronomical Society, and that's another story. <laughs> um, he had his own workshop and just designed and constructed several pieces of equipment, most, most notably an angiocardiogram. Now, t h a t s taking very rapid x ray pictures of dye flowing through a, a heart blue b a b i e s Which was, a, you know, begin, surgery was beginning to get better and better, and they needed to know um, the surgeon needed to know exactly what was going on in the heart, and you could only do this by taking. Um, a, 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 the, there used to be a team of radiographers going around the country who were very strong and they pulled the plates out of the machine very quickly. And Smith Clark made a machine which did that. He uh, other things would turn over beds of uh, burns patients. Hydraulic hoist for lifting patients out of bath, and an extempore tool to remove a broken femoral pin. He made a strong stroboscopic device for eye testing, and an electric trepanning cutter for neurosurgery with a pressure-sensitive switch uh, switch off after it cut through the the bone. He contributed a chapter of uh, the eye in industry in 1951. By Dorothy Campbell, a n i g h surgeon who, uh, uh, who he consulted in the past. And uh, this is only a story I've heard, and I'm unable to find the, the truth of it, but I've heard it would be. He, he, he probably had severe chronic sinusitis, and he was having a, an operation intra, intranasally under local anaesthetic, but the scissors weren't really working very well. So they got off the table, they took away the scissors, redesigned them, had them made in the in the Elvis tube room, and went back. <laughs> <laughs> so that the s e r v i c e was complete, but not only one day. <laughs> Now we come to the most important, I think, um, contribution. In 1952, the senior administrative officer of the Birmingham Regional Hospital. Was concerned about breathing equipment available in, in the event of p o l i o Remember it quite well. You know, I wasn't allowed to go to the swimming pool and so on and so forth. And you know, friends got. You, sometimes it's just a, a weakness of the shoulder. Or, or I remember when I played cricket as a student, our wicketkeeper had a shortened leg because he'd had p o l i o in the leg. But there was a problem of the people who had what was called bulbar p o l i o Um, which affects the nerves for breathing. The secretary set up a subcommittee to study the problem and find a solution. Smith Clark was co-opted on to it for his engineering expertise. Now, um, oh yes, I'm not really t e l l i n g you. This, that is his letter uh, when he retired from Alf. The Birmingham region had 48 both Nuffield, stroke Nuffield, cabinet respirators, iron lungs, but actually they wouldn't, and that is one from South Australia, um, where they had a bad epidemic in 1937, and Edward Both um, was an inventor and engineer, and he knocked up a wooden version of the. Um, What um, was steel? I haven't got a picture of that. Sorry. Um, on 
it. And one of his hospital rounds, Smith Clark had been, because he was extremely, he was a very hands on man. Uh, he was horrified by a patient, a female patient, being nursed out of the thing. The, the way it worked was that this bit slid out to get at the patient, but they couldn't be out for too long because they couldn't breathe, um, although they always do. But it wasn't a very useful sort of machine. Um, and the coronary, he suggested various ideas to um, make them better. But nurses have complained that it's difficult to manage in the patient in the cabinet because there are only two, two um, portholes close to the head. They couldn't get out the rest of the patient. Um, and, and one small window, and it hadn't got an alarm. And the pump unit uh, there was really rather noisy. Um, and it, it wouldn't be <coughs> hard to work if the power failed, which in the post-war period, it wasn't uncommon. Um, anyway, together with this hospital senior physicist and others, uh, both was dismantled um, in, a in a disused area shelter. Um, and he, he Smith Clark made the drawings and patterns were made. J.J. Parks, who was the managing director of ours, had the larger castings made in the machine in the factory, while Smith Clark machined smaller parts in his own workshop. Many uh, modifications were made. Uh, oh, yes, this is the Nuffield <coughs> both. Um, Lord Nuffield saw both machine, he <coughs> saw one, and made one actually in London to, to try and save the child. And Nuffield was very impressed, and he, he uh, um, looked at it and asked expert advice, and he said he'd made 5,000 for distribution all over the UK and, and, and the Commonwealth, or the Empire, as it was then. Actually, only 1700 was made, this was 1938, uh, 39, before war broke out, and obviously it, it stopped. Um, but the, the, you see, this is a 20, the RHB 20, uh, number one. You can see it's very similar to what I just showed you. Um, actually, it's slightly out of order. That's, that's the original type of <coughs> steel iron um, which was American, very expensive, and had to be shipped back to America if you needed to do work on it. So it wasn't really very practical. Um, this is <coughs> number five. Uh, but you can see already <coughs> it's got wheels. The other thing, didn't have wheels. It needed two men to actually move the thing. Uh, and, um, made the pump better and so on. Um, and you can see that the, the, the many modifications, large windows, multiple portholes, small cork holes for drips and catheters, a tilting mechanism, electric light valves for heating and lighting, rub wheels and a simple paint alarm. And the pump was made easier to work manually. All this was completed by August 1952, from May 52 to August 52. And they, it was inspected by the Ministry of Health and recommended that kits of parts to modify all UK both respiratory should be produced. Now, two former Algis employees that set up the company, um, I've got to see them because you see how it wheels up, uh, and there's a rum collar. Um, two, um, um, Alvis employees and set up a company, Cape Engineering of Warwick, and actually named after the local pub, which pleased a lot of them. These uh, and they won the contract to manufacture the kit with Smith Clark as con consultant. He then completely <coughs> redesigned um, the government respirator. And it was called, it was originally called the Common Trip Respirator. <laughs> Um, but it was described in the Lancet by uh, Smith Clark and uh, Dr. Galpin, who was at the Whitley Isolation Stroke Fever Hospital, and he mentioned the fact that it was, looked a bit like an alligator. So it came to be called an alligator, and you'll see why. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant it took a lot less ward space, 
and it was much easier, much more comfortable, and the visibility of the patient was so much better, and so forth. Uh, you understand, you know, that it really was a pretty impressive piece of work, but the same in and sort of vaccines were coming along, and so fewer and fewer people. All this later work on what Smith Clark called a junior respiration and other devices were presented as a James Clayton lecture at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in December 1956. Um, oh, yes, just, just to show you, there's a baby one there. Um, over here, um, now, he unfortunately he couldn't give that lecture because he was ill, and it was read for him by the hospital secretary, S.C. Hill, with whom he compiled a book, the booklet on the box, both modifications. Within the, the lecture is a historical summary of artificial respiration, which at that time I don't think anybody in the back could put for a profession could have better. There were descriptions more modern cooking, including drinkers, iron lung, pulsators, crevices, and rocking bed. And then the junior respirator, or Smith Clark respirator, which was this one. Uh, and uh, that was then produced by Cape, um, and uh, was pretty successful. A Dr. T. E. Wayne, who was a consultant at Comet in Coventry Hospital, and he said this, came to Cape and suggested they might incorporate it in an anaesthetic machine. I, I, I have had great difficulty in trying to find a picture of it. They were about half the size of a mini, but they were incredibly reliable. I remember using it myself. Um, anyway, I'm going to go on. Despite being held in high regard by his peers, he was never honoured by his country. During the Great, great War, he um, joined the Aeronautic Inspection Directorate and inspected all the area in, in Coventry and elsewhere. It set standards for carburetors and magnetic. And that might have you know, attracted some recognition. He got 15 pounds, I think, for non or something. Um, some of the current war effort in the World War II was more locally based but of national importance. Two astronomers, Royal, uh, had asked his advice for the Royal Observatory of Hoxman to a jogger back. So Bernard Lovell actually came to talk to the Coventry Technical <coughs> College Astronomical Society. And Smith Clark said, well, I'm, I'm getting old and I'm not so keen on the, on the, uh, on the telescope. Would you like it? So he was trying to sort of draw all back. Eventually went to um, Manchester University and then to Salford um, Astronomical Society. Uh, he became a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. These efforts alone <coughs> should have been recognised and honoured. But it's only half of what he was doing with mankind in terms of the iron lungs and ventilators. It was rumoured he was to be recognised in the 1960 birthday <coughs> honours, but he died on the 28th of February 1960. I, th I think he deserved the 90th. I don't know whether you agree. Anyway, um, oh yes, actually, this should have been added. That. If anybody is really interested, you can read it online in, in, um, on the Institution of Mechanical Engineering <coughs> website. This is the plaque. Uh, put up on his birthplace in um, Pukley. Um, and that's me, <laughs> a bit younger. Um, 2009 it was, and his great niece um, unveiling it. Um, and I think that's it. But if anybody has questions, I'd be only to please do. Thanks. <coughs> uh, <anyway>, <laughs> Yes, yes. That's really I've, I've seen, I've seen pictures of the long service Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so there was a certain amount of dispute. I um, just go back one. Just one another one. That's one. The the Elvis register is that's me. I mean that's my badge. 
And the Elvis Owner Club is a rather sort of Richard group uh, who run very beautiful pre or post war Elvises. And they said, oh, well, Elvis didn't really start until 1920. But in my book, there's a photograph uh, um, of the um, uh, commemorating the 21st anniversary of Elvis, which was from 1919. So even though it wasn't necessarily called Elvis in 1919, the company basically was formed. Um, was, was there any research on the... Uh experience of patients in the improved iron lungs? Did I think, improve yes. improve their prognosis, for instance? Or? Oh, yeah, yes. I mean, the thing is that it varied tremendously. And there was, a, you know, to a certain extent, people did get better. Yeah. And the rocking bed was a way of tilting the patient backwards and forwards because the guts pushed the diaphragm up and then went in. Yeah. So it breathed them up. And some people were able to sleep like that. You know, because that was bringing in enough air. Um, the, the um, and but the, I, I don't know whether there's still anybody alive in an iron lung, but there was a few years ago, not very long ago. Um, Did anyone ever get better and come out of the iron lung? Sorry? Did they die? Did, did they die because they were young? Did they get better? Could they get out of the iron lung and recover? But, uh, I think people gradually recovered a bit and got better and better at being out of it. Oh, in that, that they often wore, had a mask on right. or a cuirass, which is, you know, the cuirass is an armour type thing, but it, it produced a negative pressure which opened, you know, the lung. Mm -hmm. And I, I think people improved that way, but some people... I remember a, a very nice man called Geoffrey Spencer, who was in charge of the intensive care at St Thomas's, um, and he said that he had a patient who used to go to Wimbledon in her right lung, but oh. she didn't really need it. <laughs> but she meant she was down by the... <laughs> by the <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I, I, I don't know whether I think it might be. I don't know whether you can read it, but this was a gold watch that they, the, the company gave um, Smith Clark, and it was made by Alex Edwards in Spawn Street. Now, you know, there's a long tradition of watchmaking in, in Coventry. Did, are these still? No, it's no, I, 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 can't, yeah, I, can, I can imagine that's true. Um, and uh, there, you see, it's got, it's got the hyphen. <laughs> Hello, yeah. I, I'm just interested in the idea that he, he wasn't particularly self-regarding. Um, I, I just wonder why he bothered hanging on to his, um, his uh, title of captain that he, he got during oh, the yes. First World War and also adopting a double-barreled name. Yeah. Even yeah. though I can see yeah. that, that, that there could be some family reasoning behind yeah. it. I, I, it's interesting. Um, he wasn't, you know, a, as far as I, think, oh, I can't tell really, can I? But he didn't seem to be a chap who pushed himself forward a great deal. But the captain thing, I think, was, you know, quite, quite an honour. And there were people, I mean, Harvey, who was their principal racing driver, said he was a major. Um, and there's a, an even man called Marindas, who was never a captain, <laughs> and he called himself captain. And, but the, uh, the, the hyphen almost came by chance, it seems to me. I've got a little chapter, the enigma of the hyphen. <laughs> it, it sort of appears out now and then, you know, not the... Uh, if I could just follow up on one other thing, that, that uh, a possible link with another car firm, because you, you mentioned about um, the iron lung being manufactured uh, near By the, 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 the coast yeah. in Warwick. Yeah. Um, because uh, Donald Healy had his factory there, and the, all the workmen went to the Cape, and the Cape was quite an important sort of feature of their um, oh, really? um, uh, car history. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I didn't say it, but Nuffield turned over part of his Cowley factory to make um, the booth. Uh, um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, just uh, two questions actually. Uh, one is, what, what uh, made you want to 
to, to do this research and, and do this book? Was it to do with the Alvis car or the medical side? Oh, and, uh, oh right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you're going for. And secondly, the, the Iron Lung, can, can you explain how it worked? Oh, to work out yes, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, um, normally, when you breathe, your diaphragm goes down, your chest expands, it creates a sub-atmospheric pressure, negative if you like, between the chest wall and the lungs. So the lungs then expand. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so what you do with the iron lung, you encase a person absolutely airtight, and you introduce a negative pressure of some atmospheric to be exact into the iron lung, which expands the chest. It's, it's, it's fairly simple, but it's, um, and, and there is a, you know, there's some relevance today with the COVID thing. I think there are sort of smaller versions of the iron lung being used as well, because it saves putting a tube down the, the um, windpipe, which can be pretty unpleasant. There's some great uh, examples of all the bone train uh, scooters and, and uh, cars actually in this museum. Yes. The front wheel drive, the yes. first Alvis, also the, the yes, that's scooters right. and things, and yes. also the early uh, TJ yeah. Well, I, um, I, you know, I, Peter sort of, I think, suggested that I might come and talk, but I'm, you know, delighted to be able to do so. And that, Going back to what, asking me about Alvis and, and, and the Iron Lung, I bought a book in 1966 called, I don't know, it, well, it was subsequently, and there was something about Sue Clark in there, and there was inaccuracy about the Iron Lung, and so that sort of <coughs> triggered my interest originally. Yeah. Um, at that time, in the war, he made tanks, not cars. Did he have anything to do with Cannons. In, you know, in the war, yes. the at the Alvis, well, there were a lot of shadow factories. I mean, in fact, um, so did he help with the tanks as well? Did that man help with the tanks? Did that, did that. Tanks, yeah. Oh, no, the tanks were really post war. They, they actually made a tank, it, there was a scout tank in, in the late 30s that they made. I think they sort of when it was in Florida before the war. But they were they called it the Dingo. And then Daimler BSA Daimler yeah. made one which Ministry of War or whoever decided to have. And they jolly well called it the Dingo. Which is the obvious name. Yeah, it's just on the same thing that it was interesting that you said after the First World War he was taken on by Daimler. You know, I think pretty much everyone here would recognise that that was the first car factory. Yeah. Uh, but it's probably yeah. not as widely known that the, the yeah. First World War that they were put over to aircraft. Yes, yeah. yeah. I beat the, the, beat the old uh, factory because there's an immense amount of cars in there. Yeah. And, and armoured cars and things. Yeah. I went many years ago actually. Um, the other thing was just how some of the most simple things yeah. that would seem obvious. Oh, the genius yeah, things yeah. like the, the windows in the uh, in the yeah, long yeah. having things for traffic <coughs> trees together, yeah. and, and the wheels and looking at it. Yeah. I think most people now just think that's obvious. Yes, I know. Well, well, you know, things develop, don't they? It, 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 people, it's the feel for people, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I, I actually, both the James Clayton lecture and the the. Um, it's a chairman's address, uh, well worth reading. They're actually, I've reproduced them in the book. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, anyway, <laughs> I think I've gone on long enough. I think. Oh, sorry. The, the, the gentleman's first question over there was what was your motivation yes. for researching him in such a depth? Was it the medical aspect? Well, both. Uh, the I, yeah, I, 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 uh, there, there was a book about Alvis in 1966, which I bought, having got my own. Um, and there was something in it about Swiss Clark which was inaccurate to do with the medical part. And subsequently, um, I have an appendix in Alvis and the story of the Red Triangle, which went in four editions, about his medical um, and his radio and his uh, aeronautical stuff, and, uh, 
But it, I was I was asked to, to do something by Ken Day, who authored the the the, 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 the story of Red Triangle, with a view to the, this side. Um, but uh, anyway, that, that's, that's but I, I don't say I, I really ought to have done this at least thirty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> As, as an anaesthetist, yeah. I mean, where, where would you place Smith Clark's work then in, in the development of respirators? Obviously, very, very topical subjects. Yeah. Well, it's the yeah. last 18 months. I, I can tell you that he, he was a remarkable chap in that there was a Dr. Beaver who made a ventilator in the 50, early 50s, which used a rubber diaphragm valve. And Smith Clark made a, a dozen of these, and he wasn't satisfied with them because they got stuck, you know, people's saliva and, and, and so on. And so he decided that it wasn't the right thing to do. And the ventilator he made had camera operated poppet valves like a car engine. <laughs> and I was told by somebody who came that they actually used Morris Minor valves in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know whether that's true or not. But uh, he, you know, he, he, I think he was a great man. I, that's all I think. <laughs> and how do you think we should remember him in Coventry? Is there anything that Coventry could do to? I don't know. I raise I, his profile I, here, perhaps. Sorry. To raise his profile here, perhaps. I, I think he should do. But you know, I, I've had him a, a, a tribute from him. An engineer who is also Alton and very interested in, in, in uh, front wheel drive, and he said, "You know, he's really impressed." I'm sorry, he said, "Blow my trouble with my work and my research," but he's a bit of an academic like me, and he knows what it's like trying to search these things up. I mean, I've got quite a lot of stuff. Now, I'm going to ride a little hobby horse here. At the beginning of the First World War, nearly all the men leaders in Britain were Bosch, German, so we couldn't get them. And so they hurriedly started to work on making British magnetos, which was very important. The coal ignition, you know, I mean, it's all, we're beyond coal ignition now. Excuse me, could you just explain to me what a magneto is? Oh, it's just no. spark, spark, do you know? It was. Spark. Oh, sparks. Oh, okay. yeah, spark plug. Okay. But you don't need any energy. In, in the sense that when it's rotating, the magnet is within coils, which, when it's like the winds, hurts, people know that. Or, or, you know, did you ever play with those things where you, you grasp two little cylinders and somebody did that? You've got a shock. It's similar to that. Um, but anyway, I suspect that Smith Clark was involved in the development of British magnetos. I can't prove it, but I think it, it's quite likely. He'd established a reputation for knowing I think it was the BTH company. Oh, yes, it was. Yeah. But in the book, uh, in, in my book, <laughs> so, um, there are It, 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 these things, things happen by chance every now and then, don't they? And a friend of mine in the Argus Registry is very interested in magnetos. And he got a book called Magnetos by a man called A.P. Young, who apparently was, you know, big noise, who worked for the PA. And here in this book, and on the first page it said, with the compliments of the author, A.P. Young, November 21st, 1919. On the title page was Smith Clark's rubber stamp. So it was his own personal copy of that book, and it's illustrated in there. I think that's, you know, people don't give away books. Can like I just ask if you got out there, the, the Omen office? Sorry? You were Omen office? Yes. How, 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 when was your first car? How was your car? 
well, I bought my Alvis when I qualified in 1961 because I couldn't afford a model sports car and it cost 65 pounds. So that helped you. <laughs> well, yeah, but 65 pounds was more than two months' oh, yeah. salary. <laughs> if I had money in my post office, so we'd buy it. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah. It, it, it Bart's, well, I trained at Bart's. You, you can always tell a Bart's man, you know, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> And uh, there were several other Alvises at Bart's at the London Hospital where they had Lee Francis. <laughs> and did you do your own repairs? So, did, you do, did you do your own re re repairs? I did, but I'm, I'm old and weak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I can just about get under it, but it's jolly difficult getting out of it. Anyway. <laughs> can you tell us about your book and how much you're selling your book? Yes. Uh, yeah. well, it's twenty pounds, but it's fifteen for members of the society. If you were interested, um, and I'll sign it if you wish. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> will there be details going on the website? Sorry, oh, will there be details going on the Commentary Society website? We can put details on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There are, I have got files, but that's for the the people who who got. Uh, or in Pershaw. I mean, strictly speaking, I'm the, I'm the publisher, but they, they're the printers and so But it would cost you £10 past postage. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you.